Okay, welcome back. Um, what I will um, next look into is a problem that we need to address. And that is, all we have done so far is study properties of quantities on sigma t. But as someone remarked, you know, at one point we have to move away from that hypersurface because we want to study an evolution. So if you're thinking about solving the Hansen's equations, you will start from a solution at a given time, but then you want to find a solution at a later time and so on and so forth. And so you want to define a, a direction along which you want to do evolutions. This means that you want to be able to um, take um, yourself from sigma t over to the next sigma t. Okay. So the problem is move from sigma t over to sigma t plus delta t. And you know, this may seem to you like a, a very simple problem because or you can say, you know, because in our standard um, understanding of things, all we have to do is just move over a certain amount of time, which is the same everywhere, OK? But this is tricky in a situation where space-time is curved. Let me illustrate this with, with some equations. So this is the one norm that tells us about the growth or the direction along which, with the amount of which, the time coordinate changes. This is a one form. And then we have associated to this one form a, a unit norm, time-like unit norm, which is the normal to sigma t. And we call this n mu. OK, so this is just minus alpha omega mu. If we now take a, so this is a one norm. So this is telling you about the gradient of a scalar function, if you remember. One norms are measurements of the gradient of a scalar function. And if you ask yourself, OK, um, if I take the gradient of this scalar function t along the direction of mu n, what do I get? Well, you just do the algebra. It's minus alpha omega mu times omega mu. This guy is just the contraction of omega mu, which we know is alpha squared. And so this is all of minus one, uh, 1 over alpha squared. And so all of this is 1 over alpha. And so this is a function uh, of position. In other words, you cannot use the normal vector as a way along which to move, because this normal vector, uh, you, if you move along this normal vector, you will move of quantities which are different in different position. Cannot. move along n if I want sigma t plus delta t to be equal distant from sigma t. How many of you have understood this, this concept? One. How many of you have not understood this concept? OK. Um, so I, I always find students have problems understanding this concept. But then they have, uh, it's much better when I go over to a, a concept which is more familiar. Suppose that we take a a scalar function phi, and this scalar function is the altitude. Okay? Have you ever seen a mountain? Very good. So you must be familiar with this concept. This function is varying on a mountain. Okay? So we can also draw uh, equal levels of phi along this mountain. And I'm just making them up. So this is going to be a first contour, there is going to be another contour. Uh, this is going to be another contour. This is going to be another contour. OK? So you will understand these, right? This is altitude, and I'm suggesting that you know, in 
altitude, this is a low altitude, this is a high altitude. Okay, it could be the other way around. But I'm saying this is high altitude and this is low altitude. And so I can calculate a gradient of phi, and I can call this one norm omega. And the gradient itself alone doesn't tell me anything. It's not a number. It, it's, it's a one norm. If I want to know what is the, um, if I want to have a number, I need to contract this one norm with a vector. So I need to contract n dot omega, and then I get a number. Okay, so I can think of taking the gradient in this direction. So I take the gradient in this direction, or I take the gradient in this direction, and so on. Or I take the gradient in this direction. So these are all, what I'm doing in this operation, I am counting, for instance, what is the number of iso contours that I cross when I take the gradient in, uh, say, towards east, or towards south or towards west. Hmm? And, and suppose that we fix, we want, um, you know, it's three of us, and we decided one goes to the east and one goes to the south and one goes to the west. And we have to calculate how much each of us has to move in a given direction so that uh, after we've done our motion, we all end up on the same iso contour. Okay? No one has gone too, down, too far down and then one has gone uh, too far up. Well, we can't go up, but uh, as in, uh, we are all in the same, um, um, you know, on the same iso contour. And clearly, because the gradient, you know, suppose that the idea is that we go all on, on this uh, iso contour over here. If I'm moving it towards west, I will have to do just a very short motion, a very short, uh, cover a very short distance, because there the gradient is very high. And instead, the person that goes towards it, he will have to do a very long motion so that he gets on the same iso contour. So if I want to, con to impose, so this is an example where this is a number or is rather a function of position. Okay? And so this means that this is not, this is an example where this is a function, and this is, you know, parallels the problem that I have here. I have that if I go simply along n and I take a certain amount along n, I'm not guaranteed that when I go to the next lines, I am equally, uh, I am just transporting all of the events up. So what I want is a new vector, which I call t, is a vector. I could have called this whatever. It's just an, an, a vector. And I want this vector to be a bit more complicated than n. In particular, I say that it's going to be alpha n plus beta. And, and the other requirement that I want is that because I want all of the, um, of the time dependence, or, uh, the time-like nature to be associated with this part here, I say that beta is fully spatial. Okay, so to the student who said that they understood it the first time round, does this vector satisfy my requirements? If the beta is well defined? No, no, independently, beta can be whatever it is. is does this m match my requirement? Yes. <laughs> okay. Why? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, physics by hope. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. The reason why it does is because if I calculate now n, if I calculate now the same scalar product, t dot omega, so t mu omega mu, okay, what I will end up with is alpha and mu um, um, and then I have omega mu plus <coughs> zero because t and omega are orthogonal and so um, this would be minus alpha squared over alpha squared and so I have one okay so I am guaranteed now that if I do this and I move along this time vector t um, I am guaranteed 
to go from sigma to sigma t plus delta t. So what I have to do is, instead of just moving of a given amount along n, I have to move in time of an amount which is also proportional to, uh, to alpha, which is a local function on sigma, then I am, so that I am over here. So this would be uh, alpha n. Uh, I think I need colors. So this is n in red, I do n, and in black it is alpha n. But t is a bit more complicated than this because it also has a spatial part, okay? So it has a certain spatial part. Let me say it's this one. It's fully spatial, so my, my proper vector um, t will be actually this guy over here. So this is the, time, the direction along which I want to go if I want to make sure that um, in my evaluation of the events at the next slice, I am representing exactly the same events. How many of you find this bizarre or strange? You find it bizarre. OK, and you find it bizarre. Who finds it natural? You find it natural. OK, explain why it is natural. Forget about the spatial part. Just think about this part over here. Why is it that you need to correct? If you want to go of an equal amount of time, you need to correct locally for the fact that time might tick at different rates at different positions. Slice by slice, the curvature is the same. And the extrinsic curvature are not the same. That's why I know correction. As, as it happens, this has got nothing to do with the extrinsic curvature. It's got really to do with the intrinsic curvature, with the gravitational content of sigma. And if you want, this correction is coming from the fact that is coming from the fact that time doesn't necessarily tick at the same rate everywhere. Okay, so just like it is natural to think that time in this room is different than the time, you know, on the same in the same location but on the top of the building because there's a different gravitational potential. This is telling you that time coordinates, which is the one given by this object, n is telling you about how the time coordinate is growing, while t is telling you about how the proper time is, is growing. OK, so this explains why uh, you know, this is not so surprising. And, uh, why is it that we need a beta? Why is it that we have, how is it possible that, that events move around in space? Okay, if, I, if I'm here, okay, and I do a, my word line, and I, I keep going, it will just, I will always be in this position. I will not move to the left or to the right. So why do I need a beta? The answer is that is, what I said is wrong. Effectively, I will move to the left or to the right because I am in a system which is, whose coordinates are dragged by the rotation of the Earth. So this other, this other object over here, beta, is a way to take into account that coordinates can be distorted by, by the presence of gravitational field. And this is not you know, something I am inventing. This is something you can measure. It's the frame dragging effect, and, and the reason why, for instance, in a black hole you have frame dragging effect, which is the same as on a planet, but it's much stronger. Okay? So what I'm trying to say out of this is that T reflects the evolution of time in a generic curved space time, <coughs> i.e. in the presence of gravity. OK? 
Okay, so anytime you have gravity, you need to make these corrections for allow to allow for the fact that time, the coordinate time might change, might be different in different positions, and that coordinates might just move around as a result of uh, some funny effect like frame dragging. Sure. If the gravitational source is, is not what? We know the gravitational source, for example, here, let's take just the sun effect into the Earth. Yes. And then why can't we uh, measure the frame rate between this room and the room of the I, I haven't said that. I, I, I said if th there is a, a gravitational field, then time would be a function of position. Different clocks will click at different rates in different position, okay. and this is and this is embodied in this function laps, function alpha. And I'm also I said that if you are looking at the, you know the spatial position of certain events as they move along in time, this can change if you have a gravitational field. Um, and I've given you as an example the. Uh, you know, the frame dragging, because that's a very easy example. You take two observers at a, at a, with, with, with zero angular momentum, and they will find themselves on different positions at later times. OK? So it is essentially what I've written here. Reflect, uh, T reflects the evolution in time over generic, in a generic curved space time, i.e. in the presence of gravity. Okay, so <clears throat> what we have to do now, um, and I would need uh, much more time than I have uh, available, is to <laughs> so far I haven't done anything with Einstein, okay? So this was just a, 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 sh a very quick introduction to differential geometry in a curved space time. And um, that is why I, I, you know, I need mo I'm much more than, than just two hours to, to, to cover this. But um, I would be very brief in that, um, you know, asking you to, if you are interested, to um, actually look at the, at, the, um, at the lecture notes where all of this is, is discussed in more detail. Let me just say that once I have these two objects, alpha and beta, I can write my, uh, I can write the line element in a very generic form, uh, which is uh, the following, um, minus alpha squared plus beta i, beta i, dt squared, plus two beta i, dxi, dt plus gamma ij dxi dxj. So this is the 3 plus 1 split of the metric tensor. And if you want in terms of uh, in a matrix form, I, you know, I'm just saying that g mu nu is minus alpha squared plus beta i beta i. And I have beta i, beta i, and I have gamma ij here. And this explains, well, this explains a, a few things. Um, so if suppose that beta is equal to 0, d squared is minus d tau squared, if you remember. Minus d tau, the proper time. And so it, if you set beta to equal to 0 and, and dx equal to 0, then you have that d tau squared goes like minus alpha squared dt squared. So alpha is really telling you about the difference between proper time and, and coordinate time. And, and so it's perfectly normal that it is a function of position. This is the off-diagonal term. If you think about the curved solution, this would, this would be you know, the g t phi component, which is responsible for frame dragging. Okay? And this is the part which I normally call dl squared. So this is the distance on sigma t.
Okay, so now I, I, I want to go over to the, um, to the Ansen's equations. And what I, what I need to do is, you know, I, I want to have a 3 plus 1 split of the Janssen's equations. And I know that the Janssen's equations are like this, r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r is equal to 8 pi t mu nu. And in order to obtain the 3 plus 1 decomposition of, uh, of the Anson's equations, I need to do a bit of, of, of algebra. But luckily, I don't have to, to do it here, for, luckily for you, because, and luckily also for Einstein. Einstein didn't have, or you know, people who first worked this out didn't have to do this because there are a lot of identities in differential derometry which can be used to write the Janssen's equation in, a, in, in this decomposed manner. To, to, to do this, it is possible to exploit a number of identities that uh, allow one to express the, uh, the equations in a 3 plus 1 form. And these are due to Gauss, Ricci, Codazzi, Mainardi. These are all you know, differential geometry identities that you can use to write the equations. And I will not go into the detail of this. I will just want to um, um, I will spend a few words to define um, the projections of the energy momentum tensor. So um, I'll just use this uh, to remind you what is the energy momentum tensor for a perfect fluid. This is <clears throat> E plus P U mu U nu plus P G mu nu. So what I can do is I can do it here. And I use a different color so that you appreciate these are really just the projections. I can take twice the, the projection of t mu nu um, in the spatial direction. And this, uh, I call this uh, S alpha beta. So this is a fully spatial projection of the energy momentum tensor. I can take. Um, this is beta. I can take the fully time-like n mu, n nu, t mu nu, and I define this to be little e. And if you want, this is the, the energy momentum tensor along the, uh, the fluid. And so this is just the energy density. And you can define a, a current, which is um, just an, an intermediate quantity is a bit a mix between these two. So it's a gamma and t mu nu. Um, so alpha mu beta, alpha beta. And this will be the current, the energy current, j mu. or momentum density. OK. Um, 
So when you do all of this, <coughs> you end up with the following set of equations. dt kij is equal, I write them in full here, and then we go together and, and have a look at what are the, the implications. So this is a first equation, and I have a time derivative of the three metric. And then I have two more equations. dj k j i minus d i k is equal to 8 pi j i. These equations are called the ADM equations from Arnovit, Deisner, Misner, who were the first ones that derived these equations, essentially following up what I said to you, um, plus uh, using this, this, all of these identities which I haven't mentioned, okay? We should really uh, spend some time looking at these equations because they are very instructive um, for a number of reasons. So I will put in a red box uh, the equations which we call evolution equations. Okay, so these are evolution equations. And these are instead, the blue ones are called the constraint equations. So these are giving us the evolution of the two fundamental tensors in our representation, the extrinsic curvature and the three metric. So this is the first point to note. While these guys do not have any time derivative, um, that is why they are called constraint equations. This is not very different from what you have in electromagnetics. If you think about Maxwell equation, they are four. Two of them are telling you about the time evolution of the electric and magnetic field, okay? DTE, DTB, goes like the curl of, of the other. And then there are constraint equations. The divergence of B has to be equal to zero. The divergence of E has to be equal to the, the, the density, uh, the charge density. And this is the same here. These are the evolution equation. These tell you about how Kij evolves in time, or gamma ij evolves in time, and these are just constraint equations. So um, let me write this uh, here. So with Maxwell, in also in Maxwell you have that dTe is equal to 
curl of b plus 4 pi j dt b time evolution is equal to minus curl of e and then you have that the divergence of b has to be equal to zero and the divergence of e is equal to 4 pi the charge density okay so to keep the same color coding these are the evolution equations and these are the the constraint equations so if you ever solve these equations numerically or you know you must have studied electromagnetism that this condition if this condition is true initially then it's true at any time this because you can take time derivative of, of these equations and you can show that dt of div b is equal to zero at any time and it's true here too so in principle if these equations if the constraint equations are satisfied initially they are always satisfied problem is they are never satisfied not even initially and so you are not in the same position as to assume that it will always be satisfied what else can we learn from this well that there are um, terms which have to do with the geometry alpha rj kij these are all just geometry and then there are parts which have to do with the with the the feather space time is not empty okay so you see energy density momentum then current this is just a trace of, of that tensor over there okay so you can think that these terms just vanish in the case of a an empty space time a vacuum space time another um, thing that you can notice is that this one is not really an Einstein equation this is just a an identity if you want is a definition of the extrinsic curvature in fact it is a definition of extrinsic curvature and if you think that the three metric has to do with positions distances so this is a the time derivative of positions so this is a velocity and the evolution of the um, and it's proportional to kij and kij is giving you the acceleration if you want so this is the velocity because it's dt of gamma ij and the derivative of the velocity which is an acceleration is really coming out of, of, of this right hand side and so it's here that you would expect gravity to appear in fact this is not Einstein's equation what else can you learn from this is that um, there are terms um, in these equations which are uh, particularly offending and um, yeah so this term over here this term over here and this term over here together make the system weakly hyperbolic so ADM equations are weakly hyperbolic does anyone know what are the implications of this statement okay so at the coffee you can say weakly hyperbolic is bad okay if you replace weakly hyperbolic with bad is perfectly all right um, the reason why it is bad is because there is a theorem that says a, a hyperbolic system of PDEs is well posed and a, uh, well posed a system of OPDs is, is well posed i.e. if you if if you imagine that um, the solution to this system of PDEs is given by a given function u of x t okay so this is the solution of PDE
and you take the norm of this, whatever norm you want, and you compare it to the norm of the solution at the initial time, u of x comma zero, this is at most exponentially larger. Okay? So what this is saying is that if the system is hyperbolic, then the solution will not explode. Or if it does explode, it explodes exponentially. Of course, you know, a solution exploding exponentially is already bad, but at least you know that at most it's exponential. So anything that is not hyperbolic is not guaranteed to be well posed, and a weakly hyperbolic system is not hyperbolic, it's just weakly hyperbolic, and therefore there is no guarantee that it's well posed. Uh, so IDM equations are weak hyperbolic, i.e. not necessarily well posed. This means that if you try and solve these equations numerically, no matter what you do, you will end up with solutions that grow in time out of bound. So the system is also said unstable, the solution blows up, and so this is why we never ever use the uh, ADM equations. Okay, so what do you do if, uh, if you realize that the ADM equations are unstable? Well, you come to terms with the problem and you try to fix it. In particular, you are going to introduce changes to the equations that allow you to make the system into a hyperbolic form. So this is if you want a, a direct consequence that Anselm's equations are written in a tensor form, so they are not prescribing any specific uh, formulation. All the formulations are, are, are possible, are acceptable, as long as you are, you know, you, you are matching the equations in, in the continuum limit. So what we normally do in, the, in these cases is <coughs> we introduce new fields and there are many different variants, um, but let me give you just the simplest. You introduce a conformal factor such that um, you, you have a new tree metric now, gamma ij tilde, which is, say, e to the minus 4 phi uh, gamma ij. So this is a conformal, conformally related metric. <clears throat> and you can define a conformal factor, which would be just in this specific flavor. I mean, there are many different flavors. Would be just the log of the determinant of gamma ij. Then you introduce a uh, a conformally related extrinsic curvature, i a tilde i j, which is e minus four phi. K i j minus one third gamma i j k. So this is also trace free. So this is a conformally related extrinsic curvature. And you introduce new variables. Um, in particular, you introduce uh, what are called gamma tildes. These are just. Um, projections gamma i k of the Christoffel gamma j k gamma tilde i j k. And when you do this, you end up with new set of equations. Um, so this leads to a new set of equations. That is called BSSN knock or BSSN sometimes. So these are the people who have worked on this formulation, Baumgarten, Shibata, Shapiro, Nakamura, Oara, and Kojima. And if you do this 
um, essentially what you are doing uh, when you want to look at the mathematical aspects, what you are doing, you are curing this part over here. This is the operator. In this operator, you have to think that there are spatial derivatives of the, of the three metric. And here, too, there are spatial derivatives of the metric. So you are creating a system which is hyperbolic by, by doing this transformation. Um, hyperbolic and hence leads to, to stable evolutions. <clears throat> OK. There is one more topic I want to cover uh, before I close. But I, I can continue. But um, let's say at least one I want to cover. Are there questions so far on this point? OK, so let's do some accounting. g mu nu equal 8 pi t mu nu. OK. I want to, how many equations do we have here? 10, 10 equations. OK, so Einstein's are 10 equations. How many equations do we have here? So <laughs> let's start with, with, with Karl. How many do we have here? Kij is a symmetric tensor, but it's a fully spatial tensor. So it's just a 3 by 3, which is symmetric. So it's 6. OK, 6 equations here. Gamma ij is also 6 equations. Uh, how many do I have here? 1. This is a, a, a scalar equation. In fact, this is an, an elliptic nonlinear equation. How many equations do I have here? 3. OK, so I can even do this myself. 6 plus 6 plus 1 plus 3 is 16. Oh, OK. I have 10 equations. Well, why is that this different? Well, I have too many equations. You say I need more. I mean. First of all, why is this a wrong accounting or the wrong comparison? Say it again. Please tell us. Oh, <laughs> it's because you're doing the wrong accounting. These are 10 second order PDEs. Okay? And, and here, these are first order in time. Okay? So you're, you're comparing apples and, and oranges. You can write a 10 second order PDEs into 20 uh, first order I mean, uh, 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 in time, uh, into 20 first order in time. OK, so it's 20. Einstein's equations are 20 first order equations in time. And here I have six, or, or, you know, 20 first order equation. So here I have 16. There are four equations which are missing, OK? And if you, if you think about what is it that is missing, you know, there, are, there is no information, no evolution equation, no equation for, for the lapse function and the, the shift vector, OK? And so you can think that the four missing equations are the equations for the lapse and, and the shift. And so uh, this means we have four equations to specify uh, the evolution of alpha and beta. OK? And so we have 16 plus 4 equal 20. And so we have all of the equations that we want to, 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 to have. 
How you specify the evolution equations for alpha and beta, maybe we can discuss if you, if you want. But my final remark um, is when we do, when we, um, what we really replace in the evolution equations is the box, the red boxed part. The, we never solve for the constraint equation. The reason why we do, don't do this is because the constraint equations are highly expensive to calculate. These are highly nonlinear elliptic equations. You can find solution, but it would be very costly. So that if you want to find a solution to this equation between one slice and the next, you would need to spend you know, maybe 10, more t 10 times more uh, computational time than if you just don't compute them. And what you can say is, oh, well, wait a minute. I know these are constraint equations. So if they are constrained, if my data is constraint satisfying initially, it is at all times. Just like in the Maxwell equation, if div b is equal to 0 initially, then it is at all times. In practice, these equations are not satisfied initially, as I mentioned. And so what we do is we monitor them. This is a way of monitoring the quality of our solutions. These equations would be 0 equals 0, OK? So you can calculate the left-hand side. You can calculate the right-hand side. And it should be the same minus a, a certain error. And what we do is we do exactly that. We calculate how the error evolves with time. So normally, we indicate this with a, with a, with a letter. So this is the Hamiltonian constraint. And what we normally do is, in the course of an evolution, we look at the evolution of the Hamiltonian constraint. This is a number because, as I said, it should be 0 equals 0. And normally, what you do is you have something of the order 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 6. And you start with something which is of this order and then continues, this is time, continues to uh, remain of that order. Something can happen, say, if you take two black holes that merge, then this violation can go up and then can remain to very large values. Or it can just go and, and shoot off uh, to very large numbers. At which point, you say, wait a second, the violation of the constraints is too large. My solution is no longer acceptable. I have to do something else. I cannot consider this a good solution of the Ansen's equation. So the message I'm trying to, to convey is that the, while the constraint equations are expensive and are not solved, they are nevertheless important because they are monitored. They are a way of uh, judging the goodness of your solution. And, um, and so we normally and, and routinely look at these quantities during the evolution. That's right. So what you do is, at, a, at any given slice, you calculate kij, you can calculate k, you can calculate r, you can calculate all of these derivatives. And, and this is, at the end of the day, a number at any position. So you check that this number matches this other number, and it does to a given position. And if this you know, doesn't match too much, then, then um, you go and do something else. A final remark, maybe then you know I'm open to, to discussion, is that BSSN knock is not is the simplest variant of the ADM equation, but it's not the one that is normally used nowadays. Our codes, the one I will show you, do not use that set of equations. The reason is that it has uh, it is an hyperbolic system, but it has some of the characteristic speeds, that is the speed at which perturbations are propagated, which are zero. And as a result, if there is a violation of the constraint like this, what happens is that the violation remains and doesn't go anywhere. So you produce an error, and the error remains. There are other formulations which are smarter that exploit these equations. Because these equations mathematically are zeros, you can think of taking all of these equations and putting it over here. Mathematically, you are just adding a zero. But you can do it in some combination such that what you are doing is that if there is a violation like so, rather than living with this violation 
forever, what you do is you actually impose that the system recovers from it. And you have that the system goes down to a small violation. And these formulations are all variants of the Z4 formulation. Um, and uh, so out of this, there is a C, C, Z4 formulation. In particular, this is one I have worked a lot on, or the Z4C formulation. But they all are you know, daughters of, of this initial formulation Z4, which has this trick over here, which I was mentioning. The Z4 formulation introduces components coming out of these equations, which are the components of this vector, Z vector, and, and puts it on the right hand side times some coefficients so that if there is a violation, rather than living with it, you, you, you kill it. OK, so I'm already 10 minutes past, but I, I am happy to continue if you have some more questions. Yes. Yes, um, it's because whenever you try to, you know, when you solve an equation, you will never so solve it to perfect or zero accuracy. Well, infinite accuracy, zero error. When you do a numerical solution, you even for the, the electromagnetism, okay, you will never have div b equal to zero exactly. And and so this is why these 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 constraints are, are, are never satisfied. It's a, it's a consequence of solving an equation in a discretized manner. There is no way out. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what these guys have, have, have done. So they have introduced these new quantities. So they introduce, instead of having the metric, they introduce a conformally related metric, which is gamma ij. And because this is conformally related, you can impose some conditions on, on this metric. For instance, that this is a flat metric, or that has a given, uh, a given trace. And uh, because now you have a, a conformally related metric, gamma tilde, you can have a conformally related extrinsic curvature. So you have new variables, uh, gamma tilde and A tilde. And when you place them here, you replace K with A tilde, you will have that this operator disappears. And you have a fully hyperbolic operator. And in this way, you, you solve the problem. Yes. Well, I, I, you didn't miss it because <laughs> I actually haven't, haven't really explained it. Um, <laughs> so. <clears throat> Imagine that you have a, a situation or you, you have an equation of, of, of this type. <clears throat> DTU plus U DXU equal DX squared U. So this, 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 this equation has a norm, name. It's called Berger's equations. And um, is an example of an equation where um, the solution, the, the behavior of the equation will be different under different conditions. If, um, if u is smooth and dx u is much smaller than uh, dx squared u, then this is just uh, an advection equation. So whatever he, the solution u does is just translated in time. But if uh, in the situation where this is no longer true, 
That is, if dux is, sorry, I'll say this wrong. D, D, the, the second derivative is very, very small because the solution is smooth. But you can imagine a situation where this is not longer true. Uh, then this is a diffusion equation. And uh, so you, you not smooth. And um, what CCZ4 does is essentially introduces terms which are analytically zero, but introduces these terms in the equations. And these, these terms should be zero, but they are not zero. And if things go wrong, they switch on, and they allow you to go into a situation where the constraints are satisfied again. Mathematically, what you do is you take these equations and you put them via some multipliers in these equations over here. So that if th these equations are violated, you try to find a solution that satisfies these constraints. And that's why instead of, of being on the red line, you go back. That's essentially because those terms become important and the, the solution will tend to minimize the violation of the constraints. I know uh, this is still a bit uh, fuzzy, but um, maybe we, I can show you more in detail. Yes? So can we say that violation is just a measure of like, the choice of expression? Well, the violation is a measure of the goodness of your solution. OK? Suppose you take two black holes, and you make them go around each other, OK? And you and they merge and you want to know, and you still have a solution, your code is not crashed, you just want to know, is this a good solution of the Einstein's equation, yes or no. Then you can look at your constraints and you can look at this number. If this number is large, then you say, no, this is, this is something that looks reasonable, but is not you know, accurate enough. It's, 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 it's a, a measurement of, of, of precision, if you want. Yes. No, 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 there is no phase transition, yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's a matter of, of, of taste. There are some codes that, uh, or some groups that would be happy to work with 10 to the minus 4 violation. Other groups who are much more rigorous and say, no, I will not give you any formulation of the equations that is below 10 to the minus 7, for instance. It's a, it's a matter of, also it depends on, on, on the, on your resources, okay? So where do you start? You start and, 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 uh, from the, the resolution that you have. Because at the end of the day, you are solving an equation, or you know, you're always solving an equation. The precision which you solve your equation depends on your ability to capture gradients, derivatives, because those are the operators you are representing discreetly. And if you have a very coarse grid, the resolution is very large, um, then your error will be large and uh, the violation will be large. But maybe that's all you can afford. You don't have a very large supercomputer, you don't have a lot of time on a supercomputer, and so you negotiate for a, a, a small value of, of, of the violation. If on the other hand you have a lot of time and you have resources, then maybe you can uh, afford a small resolution and have a violation which is very small. Normally what people do is rather than, you know, is, is develop methods, numerical methods that allow you for the same amount of computational power to have the smallest possible error. These are called I-order terms or I-order techniques, which are essentially mathematically much more intelligent than, than what you would do with a naive approach.